I never fit in. Never could win. Yellow Rose is a coming of age story with all its complexities and more. A Filipina teen named Rose, played by Eva Nobuzada from Texas, at a crossroads of pursuing her dream of becoming a country music singer or leaving the small town she calls home due to her family being torn apart by ice. An absolutely beautiful, beautiful film, emotional and so complex. And Diane, I just want to go into how did you come up with this concept? And you touched on so many topics of identity. Um, I grew up in Texas in a pretty small town called Lubbock, Texas. And um, I, my parents were immigrants as first generation. Take everything away. You know, I think being I Filipino uh, and wanting to tell a Filipino story, immigration always is part of it. As the second largest Asian minority in America, director and creator of Yellow Rose says Filipinos feel virtually invisible. So this film that tackles race, immigration, the American dream, it all gives you a glimpse of that struggle and the perseverance to be seen and to make it. Anyone that's like a, I guess a hyphen American, a dash American can relate to that. Cause I, you know, I, I talk about this often that you know, being a second generation a Filipino American, my parents migrated here and I was born here that I never quite felt um, American. But um, when I go back to the Philippines, I don't quite feel like a Filipino. So you're sort of like, where do I fit in in any of this? You see that through Rose in the film that she uses her artistry to figure out what her place is in the world. This beautifully heart-wrenching yet inspiring journey has received praise across the country and internationally, winning awards at various film festivals and is the first Filipino-American film to be distributed theatrically by a major Hollywood studio. It, it allowed parents to talk to their kids about immigration in a way they couldn't before or um, young girls are like, that's me, I want to be an artist and I, I, I relate to Eva. She looks like me and if she can do it, I can do it. So. There's so many, um, so many reasons that I'm, I'm grateful. All of those accolades to me just mean more people will see it. Asia McKenzie, News 12. Culture. Hi, News 12. I just want the voice. Community. The first shot went into the arm of Port Washington nurse Sandra Lindsay. Connections. Seems like so much fun. It was pretty hectic. Discover News 12 New York. Hey, look, we're happy, right? A new way to see the best of News 12's local channels from across the tri-state area, all in one place. Now streaming 24-7 on your favorite devices. Discover News 12 New York today. Now this week's We're Open takes us to the Post Road in Fairfield and the fitness center that offers creative workouts through boxing, martial arts, and more. We take a closer look now at how this gym helps people keep fit. We're at Jetabox Fitness Training. Well, I previously have a boxing background, a martial arts background. I've been involved in the fitness industry for over 30 years. So I said, let me start trying to um, find a place where I can actually use my own method of training because everything I've seen out there is basically redundant, boring, or the same ineffective workouts that everyone's basically doing. Well, the hardest part for most people is breaking the psychological barrier. Oh, I can't do this. Oh, I don't know. I'll start when I get in shape, which makes no sense whatsoever. Come in now, start now, change your life now. We specialize in one-on-one -on -one training and two-on-one -on -one training personal training. You have to understand, we don't just do boxing, we do all forms of fitness. You know, that's just a mechanism we use to get people fit that's fun filled and effective and challenging. We take all types of individuals, from novice to professional, off the street, someone that has never even stepped in a gym before, has never even ran down a track or anything of that nature before. We have a method that we can train People using the philosophy is like you have to develop a strong foundation in order to have a stable future. It's been extremely challenging for me to keep my doors open, especially after being shut down for about four months in March. One effective way that has kept my doors open, that's the, the quality of the clients that I have, you know, the loyal clients that I have, understanding the significance of staying healthy, especially in 
and now. You know, when you build up your resistance and your immune system and you're staying active, you're keeping your body healthy. My passion is to see progress, to develop people in a direction where they can see themselves being better than what they are at the present time. So therefore, it's my responsibility as a trainer to make them be the best they can be in any avenue of life, spiritually, physically, and mentally. You'll knock out all your needs in one punch. And work off a lot of that frustration also, no doubt. And we have a link to Jetterbox Fitness Training on our website, news12.com, as well as the News 12 app. A Brookfield man who loves running and restaurants is using one to save the other. News 12 Connecticut's Marissa Alter tells us how. Mike Silvestri knows what it's like to run a marathon in 90 degree weather. But this weekend may be Silvestri's most extreme running experience yet. Uh, a couple of my buddies told me about David Goggins and this challenge that he's doing. And at first, thought there was no way I could do this. What is Goggins is doing out there on the West Coast? Goggins, an ultra endurance athlete and ex-Marine, came up with the fitness challenge, which is as much of a test mentally as it is physically. He's doing this challenge, it's called the 4x4x48. Four by four by That's four miles every four hours for 48 hours straight. Basically, 48 miles in two days, including running overnight. I'm a horrible napper, so that's not going to be good for me. Along the way, Silvestri is raising money for the Connecticut Restaurant Association's Restaurant Relief Fund, which aims to help restaurants struggling to survive the pandemic. Jordan and my habit of uh, running way too much and um, eating out. Silvestri has his roots mapped out with legs in downtown Brookfield, Danbury and Bethel. He'll have company for parts of the run, along with fans and it all kicks off at 11 Friday night. It's insane. It's, uh, it's definitely, you know, something kind of right up my alley, you know, pushing yourself beyond the, uh, you know, normal physical, uh, you know, boundaries. So uh, I'm just kind of like excited about it, but nervous at the same time. In Brookfield, Marissa Alter, News 12, Connecticut. We are looking at some grim anniversaries, as you well know, this week in the fight against COVID. Yesterday marked the first anniversary of the first confirmed case of COVID-19 in New York. It was a 39-year-old healthcare worker in New York City. Then tomorrow, we mark one year that a new Rochelle lawyer labeled Patient Zero became the first known case of community spread. So when you consider these anniversaries, doctor, obviously it is a time for reflection, but also a time to look ahead. What have we learned since those first cases so that we don't repeat history? As you said, is it is a time for reflection. Um, we have to look back and take a look at um, how we've slowly known this virus, but also how we've together we've put everything, all the Pro, um, all the available um, tools to get ahead of the virus. We've, in all this time, yes, we've had a lot of losses, unfortunately, but we've learned a little bit more how to treat this virus, how, how to fight it. We've developed vaccines. So there is a lot to look forward to. Um, hopefully we're turning a corner here. We're seeing that. Lastly, do you believe we have turned that corner? I think we're almost there. I think we're starting to look at the light at the end of the tunnel. The most important thing is that we're in this together. We're all in this together. We've tried to make this happen. Well, she brings comfort to patients and staff during stressful times. Thank you for bringing her. She's such a joy. Well, for the first time in nearly a year, Hazel, the therapy dog, and her handler went back to Huntington Hospital. The three-year-old golden retriever was a sight for the very sore eyes of staff who have not seen her since the pandemic began last March. Besides just being able to relax us when we've needed it with the stress, I, th I think it's actually a symbol that uh, we're getting over the hump, that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And Hazel's representing that light a little bit, so it, it's, it, she's making us all feel great. And Hazel and her handler will continue making weekly visits. Officials with the State Association of Chiefs of Police had a meeting with State Attorney General Gerber Grayroll yesterday to try and resolve questions and issues they have with enforcing the new marijuana laws that legalize possession for adults but still ban it by anyone under 21. 
News 12's Brian Donahue reports the new law is a sea change for the way that many of New Jersey's 500 plus police departments do business. Since I've been doing this segment, some people have asked me, what makes a story positive in New Jersey? And I say, well, besides being positive, it's something that's unique to New Jersey, or maybe that happens here more often than in most other states. And for years, one of those things has been police arresting people for marijuana. See, New Jersey has consistently led all states in the number of marijuana arrests per capita. In some towns like Mendham and Pompton Plains, marijuana arrests have made up more than half of all arrests in some years. So the legalization of pot possession is not just a reform of a sliver of the world of law enforcement. In some towns, it's removing a huge part of what they do. Supporters of legalization, like Devon Ward of the Marijuana Policy Project, say that's exactly the point. Maybe now the police and our tax dollars can go towards something more productive and less discriminatory. You know, what, we, what I hear from um, law enforcement folks around the country, you know, not just in New Jersey, is that they'd rather be spending their time prosecuting <laughs> major crimes, prosecuting violent criminals, um, building stronger relationships with the communities that they're policing. Um, and cannabis prohibition does, does all the opposite. It, it draws resources away from where police are needed. Uh, it breaks down trust between communities and law enforcement. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's no longer a, a sensible policy solution. But police in New Jersey are now saying the way the new law is written puts them in a very weird situation, especially when trying to enforce the law, which still bans possession by people under 21. How many times are you, are we going to be, uh, come across someone that maybe we coach with our friends or family and says, how, how, how come you didn't tell me that my son or daughter, um, you know, had an interaction because they were using alcohol or, or marijuana and we're prohibitive doing that. And I don't think we're doing a job and I don't think we're doing justice to our, our, to, uh, to those families. Yeah. As a, as a parent, I want a phone call. You know, I don't, I, I don't want my kid arrested, but I want a phone call. Um, Agreed. And also, I'm not as a get from that. yes. And also as a police officer, I think the obligation of being able to advise a parent on that initial intervention is very important. What's clear is that police and the communities they serve are going to have to get used to a pretty big shock here, especially for New Jersey having what had been a huge part of their job, just not their job anymore. I'm Brian Donahue, that's Positively New Jersey. Under the new law, only after the second warning is issued to someone under 18, can police notify the teen's parents or guardians. It is the small gestures we love the most. Two kids in Hackensack have a story to tell, and they're probably talking about it still tonight. Like a lot of little boys, they're fascinated by sirens and police cars. So Hackensack cops hooked them up. Two little boys got a tour of some of the police and SWAT vehicles they use there in Bergen County. Pandemic aside, it's good to see some of these traditions continue. If you've got a little one, hop into your local police or fire station. You just might be surprised at what they let you see in the tour you get. Thanks to Hackensack police tonight for doing Jersey proud. I'm sure those boys had a lot to talk about, Dave. That's so awesome, especially when they get to play with the sirens yep. and stuff like that. Oh, that's fantastic. All right, vaccines work. Now, this may just look like an ordinary Zoom class during COVID times, but these students are learning about the shot that could bring back some normalcy to our daily lives. The actual coronavirus vaccines, like how many people have gotten them, where are people getting them? I want to provide them access to finding information so that they can make the best choices for themselves and for their families. Michael Becker said he developed the curriculum for his environmental science class to arm his students with information about the virus and the vaccine and the facts behind it. If they don't want to get the vaccine, I want it to be because of science. And he's not just teaching them about antigens and antibodies, but about what communities have been hit the hardest and why. Reasons why maybe people of color or low income communities might not have the same access or the same level of trust to get the vaccine. Senior Myron Sanchez says the class has allowed him to learn about the virus and the vaccine and help answer some of his mom's questions. I'm really glad I could give her actually like 
real information that teachers gives me and stuff. And every time she has a question, I'm there to answer it. The class also examines historical vaccine cases, how they work, how they are developed, and more. This is like probably the most important thing you could be teaching is like what's happening now. And we can modify it as we go. Marissa Marcelino, News 12. For months, Negril BK has been offering outdoor dining, individual enclosed tables with heaters above and also on the tables. It's just fun to eat outdoors here. It was awesome. And now the owners are excited to welcome customers back inside too. We cannot wait to provide that great experience um, again indoors uh, that we have also been providing outdoors. Negril BK has three separate rooms inside, plenty of space for tables to be six feet apart. We are quite fortunate to have such a huge space. And they're putting safety first. We've done a lot as far as changing to the HEPA filters, um, getting the pure air quality in here as, as well and just making sure that, you know, everything, our sanitizing uh, procedures are well in effect. We do the temperature checks, we sanitize after every table is gone, we sanitize before they sit down, we have separate bathrooms for our guests. The owners say it's been really difficult only being able to offer dining outside, especially on days when it snowed. We try to say, okay, how heavy is the snow going to be? There's so many different factors because at the end of the day, we still have rent to pay, we still have bills to pay, and we still have our staff to pay. And we want to make sure that we're here and that we're going to last as long as we possibly can. The owners tell us it means so much to them to be able to provide more customers with the unique Negril BK experience. I think this space is pretty special with being able to create that vibe in here. I think we have the energy, our staff has the energy. I think it's just a, a, a vibe that lives in this building. Great drinks, great atmosphere, and one love across the board. In Park Slope, Emily Lorsch, News 12. Emily, thank you. And now I'm really hungry this morning. Got to check it out. Uh, be sure to tune in to We're Open. This is every Friday we have this at 7 p.m. right here on News 12. One person's trash is another person's treasure. And a 15-year-old from Ossining is proving that saying true. And as News 12's Eric Feldman shows us, he's changing lives for the better. Meet Sam Nadel. Hard at work. Probably the last one I have that I can fix right now. You may think all the different colored wires look daunting or that all the pieces look the same, but not Sam. He's a computer doctor. I've concluded that this hard drive is dead. He's not old enough for medical school or even college. Sam is a high school freshman. His love for computers started a few years ago with an old one in the attic. Started taking it apart and it was... I don't know, I guess it was cool. And he was hooked. He watched YouTube video after video, testing old computers, all nicked, losing their sparkles, seen better days, all thrown away. There's good stuff there. I've seen it when I'm throwing stuff away that I can't use and that I can't take it, but it could go to so much better use than what it's going to do. So Sam found something to do. When COVID hit, Sam got a grant from his high school, Hackley. He wanted to start giving these laptops to people who need them for free. And his nonprofit Reboot was born. Recycling centers are giving him computers. Companies are donating their old laptops. And Sam, find some good RAM, gets to work. He fixed up this computer with a burnt out hard drive in about 10 minutes. All of it in. Who's this computer going to? Whoever requests it next. People desperate for a helping hand reach out to Sam. Like this one. 73 people have had their lives changed by a 15 year old who has created his own genius bar. I'm amazed by the acts that he can do to help other people better their lives. These are some of the people who have emailed Sam, a retired senior. We need a computer system to Zoom to keep in touch with family and to avoid travel. A job seeker. Anything I can use to write and send and respond to emails on my job hunting. A 14 year old. I've tried to use my parents really old desktop, but it won't even let me use Zoom for classes. Sam delivered all of them computers for free. Feels really good. But Sam doesn't think about it much because there are more computers out there to save, more to fix. Because this doesn't work here. And more to give. In Ossining, Eric Feldman, News 12. Pretty cool. So if you want to help Sam with Reboot, they're always looking for donations. So to learn how you can help, just click on the story on our Facebook page. Well, if you need dinner plans tonight, new... By using the power of music, health officials in the city of Mount Vernon are hoping that this Run DMC rap video is in tune with getting more residents vaccinated. 
Oh, the video helped in a major way because you know we 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 walk the walk, right? And we talk the talk. The time for us to trust and not debate. The vaccine, believe it's safe to take. The video was just one way. Judith Watson, the CEO of the Mount Vernon Neighborhood Health Center, says she is getting the word out that the vaccine is safe, especially in a community that has been disproportionately affected by COVID and one that has had a long-standing distrust toward medical science. Whenever we've sent it out by a blast, we've seen an increase in the number of incoming calls for the COVID vaccine. Mount Vernon's mayor has been working with Watson to spread the word about vaccine availability. And she says hesitancy within the community has been subsiding. I, I want to really shift the conversation from vaccine hesitancy to vaccine availability. We are doing that work. Patterson Howard says in addition to the pop-up vaccine sites around Mount Vernon, the mass vaccination site at the Armory and Yonkers that gives Yonkers and Mount Vernon residents priority will be changing come this Wednesday when appointments will open up to all residents in Westchester County. After Wednesday, they don't lose access. They just have to share access to the portal with other communities so they continue to have access. They just will not have the same priority access. So officials hope residents take advantage now. Gotta act now. No need to wait. Get your vaccine before it's too late. For real. Antoinette Bjorty, News 12. So if you want to see the entire Run DMC vaccine video, just log on to our website at news12.com. A very special visitor for some Connecticut kids today. First Lady Jill Biden stopping by this school there in Meriden. You hear the kids cheering along with Dr. Miguel Cardona. The new U.S. Education Secretary grew up there. News 12 Connecticut's John Craven at Benjamin Franklin Elementary School in Meriden. John, the whole town excited about this. <laughs> Della, you better believe it. This whole sidewalk behind me was packed today. Yeah, they were excited to see the first lady, who wouldn't be, but they were really excited to see Miguel Cardona, their hometown teacher, who's now in charge of the nation's schools. Hi, Jill. Hi. Hi. A humble hello from one of the most powerful women in America. First Lady Jill Biden stopped by Rachel Valentin's kindergarten class. I think I was more nervous because kindergarten is kindergarten. You know, you're just not sure what's going to happen from day to day. In Meriden, a huge crowd, but they weren't here just to see Biden. They wanted to see Dr. Miguel Cardona, the hometown teacher just sworn in as U.S. Education Secretary. We're so proud of you, Miguel, and good work. After the tour, Cardona said his top priority is reopening America's schools. Across the country, future Lin-Manuel Mirandas are sitting at home instead of going to the drama club. Like Miguel said, you know, teachers want to be back. We want to be back. But in other states, many teachers are pushing back. Our districts must unite. Our districts must unite. Here in Connecticut, some teachers initially protested. But at this school, 70% of the kids are already in class and another 200? are coming back this month. We have teams that you didn't even see getting ready, our custodial staff, our clerical staff. Wait a minute, okay? I want to move to the As the first lady toured her class, Rachel Valentin wanted her to come away knowing one thing. Teachers are, are they want to be in the classroom and we can do this. And you know, vaccines are such a big part of that effort. Here in Connecticut, as you know, teachers started getting their shots this week. Here in Meriden, the first batch of 200 educators, they get their shots tomorrow. That's the latest here in Meriden tonight. John Craven, News 12, Connecticut.